Hi, I'm Paul Goddard, Clinical Hypnotherapist and NLP Master Practitioner. This interview is with Dr. David Hamilton. David is the author of seven books, with an eighth in the pipeline, plus two audio CDs. He moved away from working in the pharmaceutical industry, developing drugs to help fight cardiovascular disease and cancer to become a self-help guru. During this interview, he talks about his fascination with the placebo effect and how this eventually led him into being an advocate of self-love. He is an open and honest man and has now reached the point of embracing vulnerability. In 2012, during the Scottish Hay House I Can Do It conference, David was waiting to be introduced onto the platform when he had a sudden feeling of not being good enough. This feeling was caused by a flashback to his childhood when everyone in the class was going on a school trip except himself. David knew his parents were struggling financially and therefore did not ask them for the money for the trip. All those going were given a yellow sticker. David was the only one without a sticker and this made him feel unworthy. Always one with an inquiring mind, David wanted to investigate why he had these feelings of not being good enough, even though he had achieved so much. We'll hear more of this within the interview. In the meantime, relax and enjoy as we listen to this amazing man. David, I'd like to thank you for sparing the time to do this interview with me today. I'm going to talk about when you first got into the pharmaceuticals and when your first interest in the mind-body connection, a little bit about loving yourself, because I think that's a very important thing, and also a little bit about what this talk is about. But I wanted to start off by asking you, you first, that I know, became interested when you went to a library as a child and got a book for your, your mum who had depression. Would you like to talk a little bit about that, please? Oh, yeah, you've done your homework, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 was, I was in my my uh, first year at high school so I was like 11 just going on 12 you know and the the English teacher had taken us a, t- a tour of the library and at the time my mum for the previous five years had been suffering from postnatal depression and it had been really really bad and really really hard for her and you know my mum didn't really say oh I've got depression but you can tell as a child you, you know you just get that kind of vibe and I really wanted to help my mum and I was beginning to develop this interest in you know how can I help my mum and you know people might find this really corny and surely not but a book fell off the shelf in the library and it was called The Magic Power of Your Mind and by a gentleman called Walter Germain and I immediately thought you know I bet that would help my mum so I just put it in my bag and took it. I hadn't yet learned that you're actually supposed to join a library you know get the wee you remember back in this was 19 now this was 1982 and you used to get the wee yellow tickets, and it was before all. I didn't even know you were supposed to get one. So, so anyway, I took the book, and it really helped my mum. It didn't like obviously didn't cure depression in a day, but it taught her self development strategies, in particular meditation, and in and especially affirmation. So between meditation, so relaxation, as we called it then, you know, thirty odd years ago, a uh, relaxation and affirmations, those helped my mum navigate a course through some of the trickier, the, the more difficult days. So I would often hear my mum saying, it's all in the mind, she'd pump her fist like an affirmation, it's all in the mind, mind over matter, I can do it. And it was all, and it's a thought that counts, which incidentally became, inspired the name of my first book, actually. So I grew up in an environment as a teenager where I would regularly hear my mum talk about the power of the mind, not with any great degree of scientific knowledge or anything like I, like I talk about nowadays, but uh, basically just with knowing herself through her proving to herself that the mind is an extraordinarily powerful thing. So uh, several years later, I had done a PhD in chemistry. I, I'd put my interest in the mind-body connection and, and reality and stuff to one side while I went down the classic academia. And I found myself working for a big pharmaceutical company, one of the biggest in the world actually, building drugs for heart disease and cancer. 
And it was then when my interest in the mind-body connection began to really peak again because you're, you're learning about the placebo effect and the extraordinarily high num amount of people, high numbers of people who improve on a placebo because they think they're getting a drug. So that and a number of related things around that time it was my, enough for me and I, I left the industry four years later to start researching and writing on it. So when you got into the pharmaceuticals and you were noticing the placebo effect, were other people also as interested in you and did, were there people that worked with you that followed your beliefs or were you keeping quite quiet about these beliefs because of being nervous about it? it actually, I, I had a small circle of friends who shared the same kind of fascination. And we went, at the time, we were actually went way beyond the placebo effect. I, I created a wee group of a four or five friends who shared these similar interests, but but more extending from placebo effect to even metaphysics and spirituality. And and I I occasionally organised things called a deep night, where I'd maybe get a recording of a you know a, a medium or something, or I'd maybe pick a book and print out a chapter for all of us to read, and, and we just sit and discuss it and, and go into really deep philosophical ideas about the nature of reality. But all of it stemmed from the placebo effect. So I could talk to some of these friends about the placebo effect. Most other people just dismissed the placebo effect as, you know, it's just the placebo It was a sweeping motion with their hand. It's just the placebo effect, like their authorities on it kind of thing. And, and you find most people in the industry have no idea how the placebo effect works. So it is just, to them, it's a figment of the imagination. It's some quirk in the study design, but actually placebo effect, belief itself causes a uh, biological changes in the brain and through, all throughout the body. That is evident, that's factual evidence. Now, back then it was, wasn't as much. So, but I certainly wasn't afraid to talk about it because, you know, despite a lot of people believe the pharmaceutical industry, to my knowledge back then, aren't really trying to suppress the placebo effect. They just don't know, they don't know enough about it. It's just a figment of the study design, to be honest. But it doesn't really bother them. You know, they just try to figure out ways round of it, round it. But back then, I had we had that little circle of friends having a deep night from time to time, just phil philosophising about the mind and consciousness and reality. There's a story I've heard you talk about where there was a lady who believed that you were a healer and you managed to cure her cold within seconds. I've done that with hypnosis, with hay fever with people in a session of half hour. What is it really that is inside people, do you think, that makes them be able to make those dramatic changes just within seconds or minutes, whereas myself, I believe it, but I'll have a cold and I'll still have it for a few days. Yeah, yeah. You, you find the... See, here's the thing, and this is, this is true for a lot of healers. Other people see more in us than we see in ourselves. And the reason for that is because we know all the little private moments of doubt that we have. And we also know all the little difficulties and challenges that we have in our lives. And, and the, you know, the, the struggles and a whole pile of reason things because, if, because we are, everyone is just human. But to someone else, they might perceive you as completely healed, perfect, have all the answers. And unless they get to know you know that you're just human, to them, you are something special, way, way, way beyond them. So other people can get a much greater healing reaction from being in your presence than you tend to get yourself. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I, yeah, I've had that experience twice, once with a, when I touch someone and in, within three seconds, their deep, deep, heavy, heavy, cold, bordering flu was gone. And another person with a migraine who'd been, you know, classic would normally be literally debilitated for half an hour and within about three seconds was amazed with that. Uh, and only because both those people, I had set the, I'd set the conditions up because I knew that they were both very much believing in what I did. And I thought, well, I'm just going to play along just to help them for this moment. And I knew that, if someone believes enough that the body does have this ability to radically change biology. And we know that from multiple personality disorder. You know, look how fast a patient with multiple personality disorder can create an allergic reaction or can create a whole... Pa there's, there's some cases of multiple personality when eye colour change, you know. And you're talking in seconds, right? So the body does have this capacity. It's how do we tap into it? That's the real challenge. It's how do we tap into it? So people tap into it when they see more in you, Paul, than you do in yourself. And exactly the same, people see more in me than I see in myself, only because I'm aware of my own stuff. But they don't know my stuff. They think I'm healed, kind of thing. 
Well, I do like about the, the new book you've got, My Heart, Me, is that it's a very honest book. You get many of these self-help books, and it seems like, do all these steps, your life will be perfect, and it will be fine. And one of the things which really struck me was the sticker story, which I've also heard you mention on various other occasions as well, just before you did the conference, and I actually saw Lilu's interview with you just before you went and actually did that. Was there any techniques you had to do to yourself to get rid of that, that thinking about the time of the sticker, or was it just like a self-realisation that helped you move on and, and get over that? There's probably three things that totally transformed me as a person in terms of self-belief and self-confidence. So over a compressed period of two years while I was writing I Heart Me, I probably grew more in what we classically call personal growth in, than in my previous decade. Uh, and it was all compressed. And there was three main things that were radical for me that, that seen huge gains in and of themselves probably equivalent in size and the first one was learning the profound ability to shift how you feel shift your biology and literally rewire your brain by making postural adjustments postural adjustments so in other words making adjustments to how you stand and how you hold and move your body uh, and what most people don't realize is when you're lacking in confidence or when you're lacking in self-esteem you you wear it on your body. It's like people say, if you're happy, it's written all over your face. If you're depressed, it's written all over your face. Well, it's not just your face, it's your entire body. And so if you're feeling like I'm not enough, for example, which is what I call stage one of the of uh, the three stages of self-love, it's literally all over your body. So if you recognise that through a bit of self-awareness, then as often as you can remember to, you can make postural adjustments. So changing where, how you're standing, how you're holding and moving your body. The, I, I used to practice the Harvard Power Pose, which is uh, something developed by Amy Cuddy, a professor at Harvard, where you literally stand in the Wonder Woman, Superman, Green Crest, Cross Code thing. I, I did that every day for months, actually, two minutes in the morning. And then the rest of the time, as often as I could remember, I would make adjustments to my posture to almost train myself. You know, people say fake it till you make it. So what I was basically doing is teaching my body, this is how you hold it, this is how you stand now, this is how you walk, this is how you move, uh, this is what you do from now. And what that actually does is it literally rewires the circuits of the brain. So for me that was significant because in in a compressed period of a couple of months, my self-belief and self-confidence literally spiked more than it ever done in my life. And all I had done during that time was relentlessly correct my posture. I mean, I mean relentless, meaning I remembered to adjust my posture 10 to 20 times a day. Something more than that. Literally, I was relentless. When I was walking in town, I almost for 80% of a half mile walk, I was aware of my spine, my shoulders, my head, my breath. So I was teaching my body for that entire walk this is what we do from now on this is what we do from now even when i was at a meeting this is what my body does from now on and it doesn't take long to wire a habit so that was the first thing the second thing for me that was significant was embracing the power of vulnerability and everyone has their own pressures in life ways that you have to be seen to be you know we all have this uh, image of ourselves that other people see as well and and part of vulnerability is, is grasping hold of that notion that it really doesn't matter if people like you. I know it's an old thing people have said, said it so many times what really matters is you like yourself. Those aren't empty words. If you really get the get what that means then what, it, what the logical extension for that is the log- logical extension for me is I am just going to be myself and even if that means showing people in my book how that I'm just as screwed up as the next person, that I have just the same amount of challenges, I've had panic attacks, I've really struggled with self-confidence, self-belief and anxiety and fears and worries all throughout my teenage and adult years of my life. Uh, and, and for me, having the courage to just say that anyway, even though there was a risk of people saying, well, I'm not going to read his books anymore. I thought he was, you know, I'll certainly maybe never be able to do a one-touch healing anymore because people are going to... Previously, people might have thought that guy must have all the answers, and then they realise, actually, no. And so for me, the freedom in just being yourself and, and saying... And, and and I think found by doing that, I developed my own voice even better. I found my voice better than I'd ever found it before, just by not really caring if people agreed with my voice. Uh, And the next breakthrough, the third thing for me, was derived from an insight that I had that self-love usually lies just at the edge of your comfort zone. And so sometimes, even if you're scared, just do it anyway. 
And so I, I realized that I was holding myself back in so many ways because I was lacking in self-confidence, I was lacking in self-love. And I thought, well, if I did those things, you know, we, we get it back to front, we think, once I've developed self-confidence, then I will do that thing. It actually works the other way around. You know, we, instead of, you know, we also say, once I develop enough self-love, enough self-esteem, I will do those things. Actual fact, self-esteem and self-confidence come as a side effect of having done the thing. <laughs> so it, how, just knowing that it actually works the other way around gives you that little bit of insight and courage to try it because you know there's a prize waiting waiting for the other side and the prize is more self-confidence and more self-love self-esteem that you've ever had before and so that was a massive insight i started doing things i'd been afraid of doing in terms of my personal life and my career uh, and so i that was my thought it was a massive gain for me in self-confidence self-belief uh, self-love so those three things uh, for me a, created a, a compressed period of personal growth where I, I would say I grew more in two years than in my than the previous decade just from you know I had a, a help along the way my, my dog Oscar who came into my life on the week that I started in the book and he passed away on the week that I finished it and, and I, I believe he came into my life for a purpose and, and it was a lot to do with my you know with that with me learning to love myself a wee bit more you know your very first talk you did had one paying person and some people I think you said you met at the pub. If you could go back in time with yourself who you are now and give some words of encouragement to that person wanting to start off and to make better choices or to do things a different way, what would you go back and say to yourself? I would say, you know, this is your passion, just do it anyway. You don't always need to know how things are going to work out and also don't be in such a hurry to be fa- to be famous enough to be I don't mean famous that you know but don't be in such a hurry to be well known enough that people will actually show up at your talks I think back then I was in a hurry to be more evolved if you like you know we talk about being evolved in your personal growth or in your spirituality and I think back then this was in two, the year 2000 I did my very first event on the 11th of March 2000 and I was in so much of a hurry to to become an evolved person and to become someone who had all these great answers that uh, I was actually scared. I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, I knew a wee bit of what I was talking about, but I was in such a hurry and put myself under pressure. And I think I would go back and say, look, just take your time. It will, you know, you can't, uh, the world will catch up with you. In other words, as you work on your own genuine, genuine growth, the world will your your reality will follow you, so to speak. You don't need to be in as much of a hurry to, to get to somewhere, you know. You mentioned, and I think it's quite important as well, you mentioned in the book about you being bullied, but also as well being involved with a gang and not sticking up for somebody that you felt should because you wanted to fit in. I think all of us have felt like that at some point. But either being bullied or if you're in a gang and think this isn't right or even the person is a ringleader because you have such low self-esteem in yourself, any words of advice for maybe somebody at a young age starting to change themselves? Yeah, you know, I, I, I was bullied a lot at school. But it's funny, I, I was actually bullied in my later, uh, in my later school years. And if now with a different insight, I, I realise that most people who are bullying someone else, most of them actually have low self-esteem themselves. They're trying to fit in, and they have a, most people have a deep unconscious fear of not belonging, not being connected to something. So people run with the gang. A lot of the people who bullied me, some of them on the, their own were actually decent people. I remember meeting a, one of them in particular who was a, a real, you know, to use a better word, tosser mm. <laughs> during the day to me. But yet he would talk to, he would stop at the bus stop when he saw me waiting there as if he was my best friend, you know, and chat to me completely off lane, but completely different things as if he thought I was great and all that. And then but the next day back in the crowd again, it, it kind of thing. You know, for, for me, the advice I would have given myself was it will pass because it usually does. It usually does. And, and I, I've been on the other, not as bad as that, but I do remember once and I caught myself and I, you mentioned that a minute ago, I, I, people were, you know, teasing. This was during my PhD. And they were making fun of another PhD student who everybody thought was kind of clumsy and stupid. And I remember joining in one time, not really, I didn't say anything, but I didn't say anything, stop it. And I felt so guilty. 
because I knew how he was feeling. And that's the last time I did it. You know, I, I thought, no, that isn't right. And, you know, I, but I remember feeling so guilty because I knew exactly you know, what that was like to be on that other side of things when people are just ridiculing you because it makes them feel better about themselves. Because that's exactly what my friends were doing during my PhD. They were feeling better about themselves, elevating their own self-worth by making someone else, by ridiculing where someone else was. And I'd been on the receiving end for so many years. You were bullied when you were talking about the placebo effect, even though you knew more information about it than anybody else actually at the talk. What do you think it really was that even though you knew everything that really stopped you from from saying, you know, I've researched this for a long time? It it was, this was long before I started working on self-love and self-confidence. And one of my self-love issues, in other words, one of the ways that a lack of self-confidence and self-belief came across was if someone showed aggression, anger, uh, in a dominant fashion then I automatically, it was like a reflex reaction, became submissive, but I became not just submissive, but nervous. And so here we had, it, it was I, I was giving a talk to a, a lecture theatre of about 100 people, and there were teachers, and it was an in-service training day for a high school uh, up in Scotland. And a few, about a handful of the teachers started, it was schoolyard bullying, actually, and a... Uh, And the first one just immediately started to question the reality of the placebo effect, a biology teacher. And despite the fact that, you know, I was far more qualified than him, I had researched the placebo effect, written more words on the placebo effect than he probably writes an entire year as a teacher. But yet I I crumbled. And instead of saying, well, actually, because he basically said, we all know the placebo effect doesn't, doesn't exist. People just get better anyway. And in all my life, I've never actually ever heard someone <laughs> someone say that. It, it, nowadays, if I was going back in time, I'd say, what? You, don't, you really don't believe that, do you? You really don't believe that. But I didn't say that. I just couldn't think. And that's it. When you, when you get into fear and anxiety, which is, you know, that submissiveness, that fear, I was afraid of them. Uh, what happens is so much about you know anything between 60 70 80 percent of the resources from your areas of the brain involved in concentration drain backwards to your amygdala and the emotional areas which is all about the fight fright fight flight or freeze response you know about self-preservation so we literally you can't think so in that moment i literally i couldn't think of a single a example of a placebo effect my mind went completely blank so all i actually said was because i was scared of them I said, oh, I've never thought of it that way. You might be right. <laughs> and, you know, and I look back now and I think, I feel compassion for my younger self, actually, because I look back and I see myself as, even though I was 34 years old, I see myself as a child. You know, I'm only 45 now, but a lot has happened in 11 years. But I look back with myself at myself and I, I with such compassion and I, I think of myself then my 34 year old self as a child who was just scared of this bully in, in, in this classroom so to speak and just didn't know how to respond it, it, I smile when I think back at that time actually because I'm so different now but that's just how it, that, that's how the, the deck played out on that particular day with the placebo effect I know you've mentioned that people take in two tablets will believe it more than just taking one. The NLP research, being interested in NLP and NLP master practitioner, they were researching placebos and actually thinking about marketing them as a relief to people, and they were finding that tiny little red pills seemed to have the biggest effect. What of your research did have the biggest effect with placebos and people's belief? It, it depends what it's for, actually. If you want to calm someone, then blue is a better colour. It was a, in fact, there was a study in a medical school, I think it was Yale, where they found that if all the, all the students, they didn't realise they were getting placebos, but half of them were given a blue pill, half of them a pink. And if I get the numbers right, I believe 36 or 26% of those who got the pink pill were relaxed and 62% of those who got the blue pill, or something like that. It was about a factor of at least two and a half times that blue was two and a half times more potent for a relaxation response and that's because we associate blue with calming but it depends what it's for i think it you know if you were given some something for growth and regeneration then a green pill might work because we associate green with nature and growth 
kind of thing. So I, I think it would depend on what it's for. Red, uh, I don't know the, the the nature of the NLP research, but uh, red would be good for a particular thing, probably better than another colour for a particular thing. It just depends uh, what it's for. But colour really does make a difference. There's been a lot of research into that. Incidentally, I, I, I came across a pharmacist, a retired pharmacist, who got great results with some people who the doctor couldn't help with a medication called Obicalp, and uh, and it was placebo written backwards. And he gave this person, this person, Obicalp, Ob he gave a lot of people Obicalp, Obicalp for years until the, the government told her she couldn't do it anymore. And, uh, and this person was devastated because nothing else worked for her. And it was severe, you know, severe pain. You know, all the painkillers, nothing worked for her, but Obicalp worked fantastically. So she just kept giving this person the Obicalp until she retired. So what actually changes in the brain makeup when people are taking the placebos and actually having these dramatic effects happening, even though they're only taking other blackboard chalk or sugar tablets? Oftentimes, the brain will produce the biology that it needs to produce to give you what you're expecting to happen. And what I mean by that is if you're expecting relief of pain, then the brain produces natural painkillers. They're, they're, they're called endogenous uh, opioid opiates, endogenous opiates or endogenous opioids. Uh, so the brain produces its own natural versions. If you were expecting a relief uh, to feel happier, then the brain would produce what it needed to produce to give you happiness. So it would produce more dopamine and serotonin. So what, what, what research finds is the brain will actually produce, because the brain's like a pharmacy, and it will just produce more of any particular bio, biochemistry or biochemicals that it needs to produce to give you precisely what you're expecting, and that that's when the that's when placebo research has gone on to a whole new level now. Is it it depends on what you're expecting. In other words, if you're expecting pain relief or expecting joint pain joint relief, or if you're expecting you know a to feel happier, if you're expecting to breathe better, if you're ex or expecting you know this little mark here on my arm to heal faster than the one on my left arm kind of thing then whatever you're expecting, that seems to drive the placebo effect, expectation plus the potency of your belief. So I'm expecting that. And so wherever your attention is directed, the brain seems to produce not only the biology it needs, but it targets it specifically according to where you're looking, where you're expecting the relief. So if I expected relief from an, a, a wee mark, a painful mark on my right arm, but not my left. The, you know, For example, if I was given a cream that went over my right arm and my left arm. This research has actually done this with the hands. Uh, research at the University of Turin School of Medicine. Then, uh, even though it was a placebo cream, if I didn't know it was a placebo cream, then I would get relief of pain on the right arm, but not on the left. And if you looked at the brain, the brain will have produced these natural painkillers, endogenous opiates, specifically in the right arm part of the brain, not in the left arm part. So our, your own consciousness, your expectation and belief, specifically with surgical precision, it seem to target whatever you seem to follow what you're expecting to happen and where you're expecting it to occur. Now, I know there's always a saying you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. If you've got a family member or a good friend that's suffering from illness, is there anything that somebody can do in the words that they choose and the way they talk to somebody to help kickstart that placebo effect within somebody? Yeah, I, I do this quite a lot. Depending on a person's level of belief, I, I use kind of affirmative language, you know, like, uh, you, you know, this is going to work it and you, you know how long this takes and, and you know, and you also know this can, this works really fast oftentimes and, and I sometimes introduce uh, little words and things into a, a conversation uh, just to help someone, like suggestion, but just in a subtle way, you know, I, 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 I use suggestion and card tricks. My favourite card trick is is chat, it's one of these things that Darren Brown does, you know, but I, I might talk to someone for a wee bit of time. And then, so I've got a card trick and I say, pick a card, any card, and I'll shout it like seven of hearts and I'll throw the deck at the window and the seven of hearts is stuck to the window. And it's only, and people think it's magic, but before this conversation, I stuck the seven of hearts to the window. I just made the person say the seven of hearts by suggesting the word seven and heart several times in the conversation. You can use the same kind of thing to induce a placebo response with someone by even just mentioning scientific research has shown that 
if a person thinks such and such a thing, such and such a thing can occur, or even suggesting some th the, the potency of a particular medication or something, and just planting those little things in someone's mind, seemingly randomly sometimes, I've found can help them in their recovery from things. It, it depends on the person, it depends on the context, but I've done that on a number of occasions, mostly with people that I know just to help them a wee bit. So your talk tonight, if you can mention a little bit about it and what we're expecting tonight for this wonderful talk. Yeah, well, the, the talk tonight at Isborne is called uh, You Are the Universe, and it's a slight change of focus uh, for me over my last, my last few books. <clears throat> and it's actually a subject that I'm covering in my new book. I, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say the name of the book. A publisher has banned me from telling anyone what it's called. <clears throat> but but I'm, I'm covering this as one of the topics. And, and basically in the, tonight's talk, I'm drawing a parallel between uh, some spiritual and religious ideas, notions, concepts, teachings, and modern physics, quantum physics, relativity, Einstein's relativity, and computer science. So I'm drawing, I, I'm basically drawing parallels and, and, and suggesting that, you know, the spirit, the, the great spiritual teachings are all about enlightenment and, and from that enlightened space you recognize that you are consciousness in its pure form you know Eckhart Tolle says you know I am is its consciousness in its pure state before identification with form so ultimately you you know the idea in spiritual teachings and in some religious teachings is you are pure consciousness in other words you are the universe and so all I'm doing tonight's talk is drawing some parallels with with modern physics, with quantum physics, relativity, and computer science, and suggesting that all three of those branches of science are pointing in the same direction, albeit using a different language. Now, you've been to the Isbourne quite a few times. What do you particularly like about coming back here in the place, and even Cheltenham? It, first of all, I love Cheltenham. It's such a nice, it's a pretty town. It feels warm to me. I don't mean the weather, but it, it feels warm. And maybe that's just a you know a psychological perception I get, but I feel warm when I come to Cheltenham. I love coming to Esbourne because I get on well with the staff. I've known them for years, uh, and I, I f always feel welcomed in the Esbourne, which is just a nice a nice thing. I, I really feel it's, it's, it's odd to describe, but you literally when you come in the Esbourne, you actually feel part of it. Like even though I'm I'm just one of the teachers, but you, you feel so I feel so welcome. That I could literally wander off the street and come in and have a coffee is how I kind of feel that kind of welcomeness. So I find it, I enjoy talking here because when I, I feel so welcome, and also I, I also, there's so many nice people come to the talks, and I'm getting, to, I actually recognise some of the same people, that I find it easy to communicate when I'm in the Isborn. I think for that reason, it's it's comfortable when I'm speaking, so there's no underlying stress of having to. Uh, when an audience over kind of thing, so to speak, it's just I, I feel comfortable that I can literally just be myself. There's also lots of people like me wanting to do talks or setting up in their own practice, whether it's hypnotherapy, massage, Reiki healing. Starting off in the business to actually make it a worthwhile career, what, what advice would you give to people? Find your own voice and just don't deviate from your own voice because the, the, the more you are determined to just be your own self. You're not trying to say, I better do that and that because people will like that better, but actually find your own voice. And, and what I mean by that is when you find your own voice, you'll notice that a lot of what you're saying is your, is opinion, is your own opinion and stories and examples and stuff, not just copy, you know, other articles and stuff and that you've read or, or you know, that you're posting on your news, your Facebook page, but actually your own voice. And I found finding my own voices, you know, in the last year, for example, my web statistics have increased by 50%. I've a whole 50%. That's how many my daily hits on my website has increased by 50%. And during that last year, it, for me, it's been more about really not just finding my own voice, but absolutely committing to my own voice and not holding back in case someone doesn't agree with this that particular day. There's other details and, and obviously when you find your voice you need to have a platform so there's a lot of social media so Facebook for me, I, I like Facebook I, I find if I publish a blog put it on Facebook and put it on Twitter I get 10 clicks on Facebook for every one on Twitter so for my kind of stuff I get a far greater readership on Facebook so I mostly use Facebook for that reason more people are likely to read 
or, or follow the stuff. Having a, a website is a good thing and build your own list. And, and what I mean by building your list is your list meaning your email list because if you're emailing people, then you need to have people to email. So uh, the, the more you find your voice, the more people will sign up for your list because they realize that what you're saying is, is important or they like what you're saying. So, and this is what I mean, if you find your own voice, people will like what you're saying because they can tell it's authentic. And that's the key is authenticity. You know, one of the things that's helped me is I started sending a daily email a year ago called my I Heart Me Daily Boost. I had no idea, you know, really what I was doing. I just thought I would love to have got this kind of email when I was working on self-love. So I started just sending one out every day. Sometimes it's a sentence, sometimes it's a page. But I send one every single day. And, and for the first couple of months, I was just trying to find my voice and I was saying things I thought I'd better say. And now I just say in my own authentic voice, whatever is relevant to me on that particular day. And so the number of people receiving that email has increased and increased and increased. And I think that has contributed quite heavily to my 50% increase in web hits in the last year. One of the things, and we're coming closer to the end now, that I would like to take part in, and I've heard you talk about it, is the elastic band around the wrist that you change over every time you criticise or judge somebody. I have to be absolutely honest, I think it will probably shift on the first day from wrist to wrist quite regularly. How have you tried it and how did you get on with it? Yeah, so it's it's called the Complaint-Free World Strategy. It comes from a, a guy called Will Bowen who wrote a book called A Complaint-Free World. And he suggests that you take a band you know, like one of these little wristband things. I, I started with my watch, I just moved my watch, but I eventually got one of the bands. And basically the, the idea is every time you complain, criticize someone unfairly, judge a person or a situation, you're making a complaint of some way, then you have to change the band to the other side, the other wrist. And the, the challenge is to go 21 full days without having changed the band at all. In other words, without having made a complaint. The first day I got it, I changed it several times. In fact, the first hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most people do. And it is, it's actually, it's easy and it's difficult at the same time. It's easy sometimes, but what I found is something always seemed to happen after 10 or 15 days. Sometimes funny things, but other times, you know, life happens. Uh, and you find, why did that have to happen? I'm at day 17. Why did that have to happen today? What of all days? Could it not have happened on day 22? Kind of thing. So life happens. It took me four months to do it. And I, I, I boasted to myself in my immediate small circle, right? So this is day one, right? On day 22, I'll be putting my name on the website as having done it. But literally four months it took me to do it. So, I, But it's a great strategy. It doesn't mean you have to never complain in your life. It's a training. This is a training program. You know, it doesn't mean you have to never complain or never get something out of your system. It's just a training program to teach you that there are more than one ways to interpret the same event and there are more than one way to communicate. Most times when we complain, it's a habit. It's a habit of thinking in a certain way and it's a habit of communicating in a certain way. So I found that it was change. It was about changing habits of thinking about certain things in certain ways, reframing things and changing habits of communication. So, and that is harder with the people that you're close to because it's more of a habit how you talk to certain people. But, uh, but that's what I found. It's just about changing habits and the habit that you generate ultimately leads to more happiness because you're learning how to get by without creating a lot of the stress that seems to follow you in your life. Because a lot of the stress that follows in your uh, us in our life is self-generated. It's our own interpretation and communication, therefore, of situations that are occurring. So the training program is learning that there are more than one way to think about the same thing and more than one way to communicate, and that ultimately makes you feel better. I remember one of my clients said they knew somebody who tried it, or heard a story at least, where they were trying for months and months, and then they got to the 21st day, and they thought, right, I'm almost going to finish. And then the TV came on, and he said, oh, that, that tie on that person looks silly. And then his wife turned to him and said, that's not a criticism, is it? So then he had to start the whole process all over again. The very last question I want to say, anybody listening to this, if they think they want to make a happier life for themselves, a more contented life, what one small thing would you say for saying just to start regularly doing to change your thinking just by one degree to make a difference in several months down the line? What would that be? I would say build a habit of a gratitude practice. And I mean, what I mean by build a habit is 
make it a daily practice to find five to ten things that you're grateful for. Now, I do this in my bed in the morning before I get up. I just think of five to ten things. Or I don't count in particular. I just spend a few minutes thinking of all the things I'm grateful for from the last 24 hours. And it's a great way to start the day. But it's about creating a habit. Because what a gratitude habit does is it, it just trains you to look at events, people and circumstances in a different way. It's not a it doesn't solve all your problems in the world, but it certainly makes a difference. And, and most gratitude research shows a subs- substantial gains in happiness relative to not doing a gratitude practice. And I'm saying substantial, about 25%-ish. Around that. But that's kind of comparable to antidepressants for mild to moderate depression. So it's not like a small amount of gain, but it, it's more it's more the habit that you need to get into. So that would be my small advice. Make it, make it a habit. And to make it a habit, you have to do it long enough that it becomes natural, that you don't have to re- don't have to think about it. So I better do my practice. It's just something that you do, not necessarily lying in your bed in the morning, but just you kind of just do it automatically. I'm really grateful for that. And you, your mind just drifts onto things that you're grateful for. And it just helps to, to lift you a wee bit. Or it gives you an extra strategy to lift yourself out of difficult moments as well. Fantastic. Is there anything you'd like to add that I haven't asked you? No, I think we've covered, we've painted quite a big, a, a wide canvas here, covered a few, quite a few subjects. So it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Paul. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, David. I'm very looking forward to your talk. I really enjoyed my talk with David, and it was immediately apparent that his inquiry in mind and his research will help us to understand ourselves much better. I like the fact that self-love will free us to be the people we were meant to be and that being authentic and finding our own special voice will contribute our piece to the puzzle that is life. Like all change, we must embrace it to the full and be aware of our thoughts and our actions at all times. After some initial discipline, it will become a habit and we will have moved away from a state of doing to a state of being. For more information about Dr. David Hamilton's work, go to drdavidhamilton.com. That's drdavidhamilton.com. For more information about how NLP and hypnotherapy can change your life, go to www.paulgoddardnlp.co.uk. That's www.paulgoddardnlp.co.uk. You can also like me on Facebook.